two minutes silence and thereafter i request sir ramesh indra singh to say a few words about anas ratan who was his colleague and professor subhash parihar about b n goswami who was his teacher's teacher so now we observe silence in their memory Thank you. Now a brief tribute to Ramesh Indra Singh. Thank you very much, Professor Sir. Mr. N. S. Ratan, a great soul, a great administrator, and a author of repute. His death is a personal loss to me because he was not only a senior colleague but a very dear friend. I had the occasion to meet him before I joined the service. Hmm. His brother was teaching in Khalsa College, where uh, they live, where I also <laughs> had uh, two years to know. Uh, he has authored many works. You know, he was a short story writer. He was a poet and a historian because uh, he has written a book in Punjabi on those. Uh, I would say one week of crucial days of Operation Blue Star. in uh, june 84 yes, uh, he was at that time uh, commissioner appeals in jalandhar and was sent uh, to uh, amritsar around 8th of june and was with me uh, there for about a week so his account is a very valuable contribution to punjab's history i would say basically he was an academician he did his uh, masters uh, from punjabi university uh, patiala mahindra college and then taught in ripu daman college nabha in nabha uh, town before he joined service in 1967 <laughs> came from a very distinguished family uh, of uh, very learned people i would say uh, many may not know that uh, he was a brahmin uh, by caste you know. Mm -hmm. uh, it was his grandfather who had uh, as it was very common in those days you see into religious movement uh, became a follower of sikhism then served in darbar sahib for a while uh, and also set up a publishing uh, 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 printing press where about 80 swaroops or editions of mm -hmm. granth sahib ji were printed by them <clears throat> the entire family is devoted to literature and art though he himself would say that i am an atheist but mm -hmm. i would say he was more of a secular person yeah, that's know, right because he did believe in uh, uh, in in the in the values which all religions preach so it's a great loss um, uh, to i would say the literary world to the administrative world as well as to friends like me is going away he'll be cherished for long time to come Uh, because of the contributions he made uh, to the administration and literature thank you thank you professor parihar satsang kal ji good evening sir <coughs> before starting our lecture i like to pay homage to our, our esteemed professor dr b n goswami sadly one of the world's greatest art historians Dr. Brijinder Nath Goswami, affectionately known as B. N. Goswami, passed away last week on November 17. He was an emeritus professor of art history at Punjab University, Chandigarh. In addition, he held visiting professorships at the universities of Heidelberg, Pennsylvania, Los Angeles, Texas, California, and Zurich. also he has served as a guest curator for important international exhibitions of indian art around the globe the most recent of these shows were titled was titled masters of indian painting 
it was held at the Muse uh, Metropolitan Museum in New York and the Museum Rietberg in Zurich. Dr. Goswami's scholarship will always remain with us in the form of his more than two dozen books, each considered a landmark study on the facet of Indian art it didn't be. Even his debut book, Mughals and the Jogis of Zahwar, written in partnership with Dr. J.S. Garewal, published by the Institute of Advanced Studies Shimla in 1967, it was a specimen of the perfection that always characterized his writings. His second academic publication, Pahari Painting, The Family as a Basis of Style, which appeared the following year as a monograph in the quarterly magazine, Marg, under the editorship of Dr. Mulkaraj Anand, it broke new ground in the study of Pahari painting. In this book, Dr. Goswami reconstructs the genealogy of the Gulir family of painters led by Pandit Siu. Using inscriptional evidence, it was for the first time that he made use of this type of material. Since then, he never looked back and up until the last days of his life, he continued to pursue his academics. His latest book, The Indian, uh, Indian Cat, Stories, Paintings, Poetry and Proverbs, it was released just a month before his demise. Throughout his life, Dr. Goswami received numerous accolades, which included the fourth highest <laughs> civilian uh, distinction, Padam Shri in 1998 and the third highest civilian honor, Padam Bhushan in 2008. As the guru of my guru, Dr. Kamarji Singh Kang, Dr. Goswami was my grand guru. I had the privilege of collaborating with him on some projects. Besides, I always shared <laughs> Yes. I, uh, sorry. As the guru of my guru, Dr. Kamarjit Singh Kang, Dr. Goswami was my grand guru. I had the privilege of collaborating with him on some projects. Besides, I always shared my own studies with him and sought his invaluable advice and blessings. Mm -hmm. Thus, Dr. Goswami's device also affects me perfect personally. Anyway, he will always remain in my thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. Now, with the permission of the chair, now we can start the lecture. Please, yes, sir, sir. Please go ahead. Go ahead, sir. Go ahead. Thank uh, you. Sir. I feel honored in welcoming Sir Ramesh Inder Singh, chair of this evening's lecture, Professor Subhash Pariyar, the speaker, and the friends who have joined us online. As you might be aware, the Institute of Punjab Studies has been arranging various lectures, seminars, and national and international conferences. Uh, two regular functions are held every month. That is discussion on a book about Punjab and a lecture on a prominent Punjabi personality. Uh, who had lectures on <coughs> Pai Ram Singh, the legendary architect who, no, he, I mean, designed most of the buildings in Lahore, the Khalsa Khalsar, and even the summer palace of the Queen. That was the great man. And I believe, Professor Pariyar will correct me if I'm wrong, he took over as the Indian principal from the British principal of Mayo College of Art. That was the distinction of this man without formal degrees. So we celebrated him. Then we celebrated Sir Gangadham, a great sir, builder, philanthropist, and a man who really was great helpful to the Akali protesters. In Guru Kabag, when I did my PhD, it was Sir Gangadham, he took the disputed land on lease and allowed the Akalis to cut wood, thus dissolving the controversial issue. Now coming to Dr. M.S. Dawa, I think it's difficult to describe 
who he was. Professor Parihar has done very wise in choosing a word from Iqbal's poetry, Didawar. I mean, there's no better word, no better adjective than this. And I've read many legendary stories about Dr. M. S. Sandhava. And Kushwan Singh says, if you have to ask me who is a great Punjabi in my life, whom I always remember and pay tribute, he says only one person, M. S. Randhawa. Professor George says he remembers two persons, Pratap Singh Kero and M. S. Randhawa, those who could build a modern Punjab. Anyway, it is for Professor Parihar to talk about Dr. M. S. Randhawa. Now, the chair of this evening's function, uh, Ramesh Indra Singh, is very well respected, well known academic bureaucrat. As he mentioned, he started his career as a teacher in, a, in two colleges in the University of Delhi, joined civil service, and made a name. I mean, highest he could rise in his profession, the chief secretary of the state without compromising. That's something very great. And then he was made the chief information commissioner. And I wonder how he managed to maintain that balance, uh, giving judgments on merit without any political bias or favor or ill will towards any party. That's why he is respected and remembered by the academic community. I personally and my institute have greatly benefited from his advice when we're doing a project on conserving the tangible heritage of Punjab. So I'm thankful to him that he's accepted our invitation to join us. Now, Abbas Parihar is a distinguished art historian, and we must appreciate in a remote area he was sitting, he did wonderful. So this, thus, if you have the will, you have the talent, you can do wonders, even if you are not in Delhi or Chandigarh. This is the example of Subhash Pariyar. Uh, both of these people, the chair and the speaker, they are great in their respective fields, but they carry their eminence lightly. We are thankful to them. They, they have joined. And I again welcome the chair, the speaker, and Thank also the much. audience, which has joined us online. And with the permission of the chair, May I now invite Professor Pariyar to start his lecture? Please. Have your Thank permission? You. Please. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I have tried to be as brief as possible, <coughs> but Dr. Ndhawa's scholarship is so extensive that it cannot be summarized in lesser words. <coughs> I have titled it The Didavar of Punjab, Dr. M. S. Ndhawa. 43 years ago, in 1980, the Punjabi University Patiala decided to honor the eminent Punjab-born English writer, Dr. Mulk Rajanand, with an honorary d degree. During his visit to the city to accept the degree, my teacher, Dr. Kamarji Singh Kang, invited Dr. Anand for breakfast. Dr. Anand, who was then editing the quarterly art magazine, Marg, came along with the designer of the magazine, Mrs. Doli Sahiyar and Mrs. Kharbhajan Kaur Sandhu, the curator of the Punjabi University Museum. I was also there. During the talk at the breakfast, in some context, Dr. Anand said that the problem with inviting Dr. Mahindra Singh Randhawa for some function is that he creates a one-man show. Following a while, Mrs. Sandhu repeated what Dr. Anand had said regarding Dr. Ms. Randhawa. Immediately, Dr. Anand became red-faced with rage and bellowed, Ma'am, how do you dare to say something, uh, speak like this about Dr. Andhava? Are you aware of the contrib his contribution to Punjab? I'll consider you a great lady if you can accomplish even a fraction of the contribution <laughs> Dr. Andhava has made. Actually, Mrs. Sandhu wrongly thought that uh, Dr. Anand had a low opinion of Dr. Andhava and thus echoed his comment. But it was just in a specific context that Dr. Anand said those words. Otherwise, he had a very great high opinion about his immense contribution 
and had written in an article that Dr. Nhava was unparalleled, whether it was the consolidation of land holdings or the application of scientific acumen to high growth in agriculture or a research in art library or the physical building of panchayat ghars in villages or establishing numeral, numerous libraries or the planning of Chandigarh or its adornment with flowering trees, making rose garden, increasing the young new talented artists, <coughs> architects and <coughs> writers. Dr. Anand had dedicated his book uh, Prolego Mena to contemporary Indian art to Dr. Randhava. Yes, undoubtedly Dr. M. S. Randhava's contribution to Punjab is simply gigantic. His selfless dedication to a just cause and honesty, so rare commodity these days, were, were exemplary. Only such an upright person could dare to advise the Chief Minister, Sardar Pratap Singh Karo, about not engaging in petty works like building cinema houses by his family members. I always consider Dr. Randhava to be the greatest son of Punjab. Really, he was the Didavar, the one with the true vision of Alama Iqbal's imagination. As mentioned in his verse, Hazaron Sal Nargis Apni Benuri Paruti hai, Badi Mushkil se Hota hai Chaman Me Didavar Peda, and Dr. M. S. Randhava was such a Didavar. To begin with, I would like to narrate some basic information about Dr. Randhava. He hailed from a Jat, Jat Sikh family. Here mm. we can see on left side is Dr. M. S. Randhava with his father and brother. Uh, he was born in a small village of Godal, also called Garna Sahab, in district Husharpur. Interestingly, uh, A. Sragis, Dr. Pahidil uh, Bagh Singh, Gulbag Singh, they also belong to this village. After his post-graduation in botany from Lahore University, he embarked on his journey into the esteemed Indian serv civil service on September 23rd, 1934, at the young age of 25. For about a decade, he served, he served, in, he served in diverse capacities in various cities of the British United Provinces like Saharanpur, Faizabad, Almora, Lahabad, Agra, and Raibreli, performing various roles with great responsibility and unwavering dedication. In the year 1946, when India's independence was looming on the horizon, he was bestowed with the esteemed post of Deputy Commissioner of Delhi. It was Dr. Andran, it was Dr. Andhava mm -hmm. who supervised the celebrations at the ramparts of the iconic Red Fort, Delhi, wherein our first Prime Minister of India, Prime, uh, Pandit Jehru, uh, Jawaharlal Nehru, delivered his first independence day speech. In, in two photographs on the occasion, in one, Dr. Andhava is seen standing alongside the Prime Minister, and uh, here it is. And in the second, he stands with the esteemed, esteemed figures of the President, Dr. Rajendra Prashad, and our Home Minister, uh, Sadar Vallabh Bhai Patel. In 1947, the partition of India was followed by great unrest and the uprooting of lakhs of Hindus and Sikhs. It was Dr. Ndhava who, in his capacity as the Director General of Rehabilitation that uh, that entrusted uh, was entrusted with the responsibility of overseeing the re-establishment of the millions of refugees from Pakistan. He accomplished his colossal task with remarkable efficiency and resolute integrity. In 1948, when Dr. Ndhava was the Deputy Commissioner Ambala, he undertook his first trip to Kangada Valley and fell in love with its natural beauty at first sight. One example is enough to show how much he loved nature. Although he oversaw the building of Chandigarh, when it came to building his own house, he selected open fields outside the town of Kharad, some 14 kilometers west of Chandigarh. And another testimony to his honesty, if needed any, is that for building his house at Kharad, he borrowed money from his own provi provident fund. 
also he had advised dr sardar uh, kero to form a trust of all his property from which his family would get a decent living and the rest of the income would be distributed to the talented boys of our villages as scholarships for industrial training mm. when the grand design to erect a new capital for punjab in the form of chandigarh was made dr ndhawa was made the financial commissioner of the capital project subsequently in november 1966 he was appointed the chief Minister, chief commissioner of the union territory of chandigarh a position he held steadfastly until the year 1968 then dr ndhawa assumed the position of vice chancellor at punjab agricultural university where he embarked upon the noble pursuit of revolutionizing agriculture research which gave birth to the green revolution transforming the once desolate landscape of punjab into bountiful storehouses that nourished our entire nation along with performing arduous duties administrative duties dr ndhawa wrote dozens dozens of books on various subjects but today we shall take note of his books on indian art in the punjab hills specifically its miniature paintings as already mentioned dr ndhawa made his first trip to kangra valley in 1948 he had already developed a liking for the captivating beauty of kangra paintings some specimens of which he had seen in the british museum london but half a century ago renowned art historian dr anand k kumara swami lamented that nothing of the kangra art survived intact contrary to this observation another scholar j c french the author of himalayan art he he did see just a minute sorry there was a phone call <clears throat> contrary to his observation another scholar j c french the author of himalayan art did see a lot of miniature paintings in various private collections during his subsequent trips to the valley in valley in the 1950 and 51 in support of rural rehabilitation program uh, program projects dr ndhawa was amazed to see that some centers of pahadi painting were still alive about the same time in 1952 he came across dr w g archer's precious volume entitled indian paintings in the punjab hills this treatise made the study of pahadi painting dr ndhawa's lifelong passion and dr archer also happened to be an fellow a fellow ics indian art lover like dr ndhawa Dr Ndhawa decided to start a systematic search for pahadi paintings in Kangra district which then included present day Kangra Guler Nurpur Kotla Siba and Kullu then he continued his search in Mandi Suket Bilaspur Sirmor Chamba and a large portion of Jammu and Basoli often the owners of miniature paintings kept secret of their collections but all of them graciously agreed to share their collections with dr ndhawa in this way from late late 1952 to 1960 dr ndhawa located numerous family collections one after the another he gathered information on the provenance and origin of the paintings and documented it systematically each discovery took the form of a book or a research paper The Krishna Legend in Pahadi Painting, published in 1956, was Dr. Ndhawa's first book on Pahadi painting. Despite my best efforts, I couldn't get any details about this publication, except for the fact that it was a small paperback publication of 32 pages, illustrated with color reproductions of 12 Pahadi paintings depicting the legend of Krishna. Dr. B. N. Goswami's seminal study pahadi painting the family as a basis of style appeared a, a decade later 
Dr. Ndhawa's second book on art was Basoli Painting, published in 1959. The minor town of Basoli was situated on the it was situated on the bank of the Ravi River, about 30 kilometers north of Putan Court. It was an independent hill state before its conquest by the rulers of Jammu and Kashmir in 1836. Its rulers, in particular Raja Sangram Paul and later Raja Kripal Paul, they tastefully patronized the art of painting. Dr. Mulkaraj Anand contributed and afterward to this book, this study and uh, earned encouraging reviews the world over. No less a scholar than the German Indologist Hermann Goetz, writing in the leading British art journal, Oriental Art, praised the book for its first-hand field investigation, well-chosen images, and thoughtful, circumspect, and appreciative assessment of the subject. In its January 1960 issue of the Modern Review published from Calcutta, its art critic recommended that every library, all the artists and enthusiasts must possess this superb volume. The American <coughs> Curator of Indian and Islamic <coughs> Art at the Harvard Art Museum, Stuart Carey Welch, was pleased with this very appealing book, which according to him will increase the number of people who are interested in learning more. The 7th century Sanskrit poet Bhanu Datta, his work Ras Manjri, sorry, Ras Manjri, literally uh, meaning the cluster of blossoms full of rasas, highly appreciates the passionate love and classifies Naika's heroes and Naika's heroines into temperamental categories. Fortunately, Dr. Andhava found a manuscript of the work that Devi Das, the painter, had illustrated around 1694. He dedicated a separate volume to the paintings of this book <coughs> entitled Basoli Paintings of the Rasmanjari. And Dr. Dhawal's third, third book on art, Indian painting, scenes, themes, and legends, it was written in collaboration with a former American ambassador to India, economist and art enthusiast, John Kenneth, uh, Kenneth Gilbreth. The reputed, the reputed publisher, Messrs. Houghton Mifflin, Mifflin of Boston, published this book in 1961. Professor Gelbreth modestly admitted that my share in the task was only to listen and partly to bring some of the lesser skills of the writer and edit to me. This book offers a spectacular glance at 35 vibrant and exquisite oh, miniature okay. Created in India between 1600 and 1820. By this time, high quality reproduction for mass product printing had been achieved thanks to the efforts of Swiss publisher and art dealer Albert Sakira. Mr. Elliot Freebond Smith, the literary critic of the New York Times, in his review published on November 8, 1968, described it as an unusually personal and engaging, engaging volume. Dr. Andhava had a special fascination for the miniature paintings executed at the court of the hill state of Kangda during the later half of the 18th century and the first half of the 19th, particularly during the reign of Raja Sansar Chand, when the Kangda style reached its zenith. The themes of these paintings were taken from the stories in the Bhagavad Quran, considered the fifth Veda of Hindus, these stories were popularized among masses by composers of love lyrics, <clears throat> Keshav Das in his book Rasik Priya and Bihari in his compilation of 700 discharges entitled Satsai. Dr. Ndhava published his first book on the subject, Kangada Valley Painting, in 1954. <laughs> Professor Osi Ganguly, a leading <laughs> connoisseur of Indian <laughs> art, considered Dr. Ndhawa's book a profusely illustrated tribute to a great school of painting, which will be of great help in, in winning new devotees to one of the finest phases of Indian painting. Another scholar, Herbert J. Stuck, praised Dr. Ndhawa's book in the journal Oriental Art in the following words. 
how refreshing it is to be able to enjoy a volume of enchanting pictures without having to digest too much technical skill. He added that whereas other books assume the existence of special knowledge in the reader, after reading this book, one has a much keener appreciation, uh, sorry, a much keener perception of the reason behind such particular paintings and themes, which is after all what a book should really do. Hmm. Dr. W. G. Archer, whose book on the same subject appeared two years later, uh, two years later, placed Dr. Andhava in the first category of art historians like A. K. Kumaraswamy, Ajit hmm. Ghosh, and J. C. French, and considered them the discoverers and pioneers whose paid work laid the foundations of the later studies of Pahari painting. These were the scholars who undertook long and exhaustive journeys in the hills, visited a large host of small states, met rajas and the families of painters, and recorded with <coughs> ready. Encouraged by Dr. Archer's appreciation, <coughs> Dr. Ndhava decided to delve much into, deeper into Kangada art. <coughs> the result was five more books on Kangada paintings, each devoted to a specific theme. The first book, in the series, Kangada painting of the Bhagavad Puran was devoted, as indicated by its very title, to the paintings illustrating the 10th and 11th sections of the Bhagavad Puran. One can get an idea of the labor that Dr. Ndhava had to put into this book from the fact that he scrutinized the paintings on the subject in such diverse places as the Museum and Art Gallery Chandigarh, National Museum Delhi, Bhartakala Bhavan Banaras, State Museum Lucknow, Dogra Art Gallery Jammu, the Freer Gallery of Art Washington, and the private collections owned by Mr. F. D. Vadia Puna, Shirimati Madhuri Desai Bombay, Gopi Krishan Kanoria of Calcutta, and many others. In this book, Dr. Ndhava elaborated on Dr. Akar's team using a variety of examples never before gathered in such a profuse manner, number. Art historian H. Goetz expressed gratitude to the National Museum for publishing such a valuable book. Dr. Ndhava's next book in the series, Kangada Paintings on Love, 1962, it deals with erotic <coughs> paintings of Kangada, but restricts itself to the illustrations, the texts of the Rasik Pita of Keshavas, produced at Guler, Noorpur, Tira Sujanpur, Alampur and Nadon. The British Illustrated Art Magazine, the studio wrote that to read Dr. Ndhava's book is to realize with what subtle skill Indian writers analyze the romantic situations and with what sensitive understanding Kangada painters interpreted love in art. Art critic Krishan Chitanya commented on the, uh, in the National Daily, The Hindu, on September 28th 1963, Randhawa's self-dedication to the cause of Pahari art and the immense trouble he is capable of taking <laughs> have already made a significant contribution to India's adventure of self-discovery. He unearthed Bisoli manuscripts in many hidden collections, uh, also the credit for the discovery of unknown schools, those of Noorpur and Nalagad goes exclusively to him. Writing for the Journal of American Oriental Society, H. Goetz felt sure that the reader of this book will enjoy the beauty of the miniatures, their pure harmony of melodious lines and of simple color contrasts, reminding of Trecento Senes and Florentine painting. And in our prosaic, sexually disillusioned time, a revelation of what love might be if we could, uh, if we would again treat it with more respect and delicacy as one of the sublimest experiences accessible to us. Dr. Ndhava's next book of the series, Kangada Paintings of the Geet Govind, studied paintings that pictured the events incorporated in the last great Sanskrit mm. Kavya, the Geet Govind of the 12th century Bengali poet Jayadev. Dr. B. N. Goswami, himself one of the greatest <coughs> art historians of Pahari painting, considered Dr. Ndhava's book as the evidence of his love of art, 
of Lord of the Hills and wrote, The artist has captured the innocence, the sense of wonder, and the sensuous delight in the physical beauty of the Geet Govind. <coughs> he added that in the feeling written notes in the uh, in the feeling written feelingly written notes on the place plates in his interpretation of the relation between the paintings and the poetry of Jadev, he brings his great joy in these paintings to be on the subject. The Satsai, 700 verses of Bihari, the court poet of Jaipur ruler Jai Singh, is one of the most celebrated <coughs> Hindi poems. The miniatures illustrating select love verses from the uh, collection formed the theme of Dr. Ndhava's next book on the Kangada series, Kangada, uh, Kangada Paintings of Bihari Satsai. Na, uh, published in 1966. Based on the manuscript of Satsai in the personal collection of the Maharaja of Tehri Gadwal, the greater part of the set is ascribed to some members of the versatile Pandit Siu family in the third generation from Manku and Nansuk rather than to any individual. On its publication by the National Museum, Dr. Goswami felt delighted that some of the finest of the Pahari miniatures have finally emerged from the bastas of the princely families of the hills into a wider world, which has grown which has grown so to love and admire them. One is grateful what? that the pleasure which Dr. Ndhava himself derived and which he describes with a definite <coughs> air of commitment in this preface from seeing these paintings for the first time with the Maharaja of Tehri Gadwal he decided to share it with the others. The last book in the Kangada painting series was Kangada Ragmala paintings, published in 1971. Ragmala literally means a garland of ragas, that is Indian melody types, from the 16th to the 19th centuries. A genre of paintings called Ragmala painting was born in northern and western India and the Dakkan. In this genre, each work was a sort of visual equivalent of some Indian raga. Each painting of the series shows one or more individuals in some kind of standardized human and or natural environment. Kangada painters also produced paintings of various ragas which formed the subject of this well-researched book. In between the publication of the books, Kangada paintings of Bihari Satasai in 1966 and Kangada Ragmala paintings uh, in 1971, Dr. Ndhava brought out another study titled Chamba painting in 1967. Chamba situated on the bank of the Ravi river at its confluence with the Sal river. It was once seat of a small ancient kingdom that successfully maintained its existence until its merger with the Indian Union in 1947. Whereas the collections of the paintings of other hill rajas have dispersed, Chamba has been fortunate in preserving its art heritage more or less intact. Its enlightened Raja Bhuri Singh donated his entire collection for a museum named after him at Chamba, established in September 1908. Dr. Ndhava visited Chamba in March 1960 and examined the paintings in the Raja, Raja Bhuri Singh Museum and some and some impo other important private collections of the old families of the state. In this portfolio of 11 paintings, Dr. Andhava reviews the development of painting in Chamba and classifies it into the following four distinct phases. The first phase from 1720 to 1764, which he labels as the Basoli phase, the second phase from 1770 to 1808 that he calls Guler Chamba. The third phase from 1820 to 1850 that is Sikh and a revivalist phase during the middle of the 19th century. He emphasizes the diluting effect of the Sikh period under Raja Charta Singh. Obviously, in search of the miniature paintings for all these studies, Dr. Ndhava traveled extensively. In uh, uh, in 1954, Dr. W. G. Archer and Dr. Mulkaraj Anand also travelled with him 
as seen in this picture. Dr. Randhava recorded the accounts of these travels in his mm -hmm. next book, Travels in the Western Himalayas in Search of Paintings. This enduring and beautifully illustrated book takes us on an enlightening journey, the next best thing to actual travel. Dr. Randhava's next book, Indian Miniature Painting, published by Mrs. Rowley in 1981, is a general introduction to the art of <coughs> Indian Miniature <coughs> Painting. Guler Painting in 1982 with co-author co Doris S. Randhava, she was his daughter-in-law, was his last book in the series of surveys of Pahari Miniatures. <coughs> Guler was a small pre-colonial hill state in the Himalayas with its capital at Haripur Guler. Emperor Aurangzeb, after he came into power, deprived the court painters of their privileges, forcing them to seek sponsorship from the Rajput monarchs. Well trained as they were in the Mughal idiom, all that they had to do under the new patrons was to change themes. Over time, they succeeded in evolving a new delicate style, reaching its apogee in Kangra painting. Guler paintings were the precursors of Kangra miniatures and are today considered the earliest phase of the Kangra art. Among the most notable artists of this style were the families of Pandit Siyo, his two talented sons Nanusuk and Manku, and his grandchildren Nikka, Patu, Ranja, and Khushal. By the end of the 19th century, however, the glory of the uh, Guler school waned as painters began to produce cheap replicas. The time-consuming procedures for preparing colors were abandoned in favor of synthetic chemical paints. Dr. Andhava's book was the first monograph devoted to Guler painting. Later, Dr. B. N. Goswami devoted one separate monograph to, to the artist Sukh in 1997 and to Manku in 2017 each. Dr. Andhava's book mentioned so far deal with the schools of Pahari painting, but he has authored three more books on painting outside these schools. The first of these, entitled Kishangad Painting, uh, co-authored with Doris S. Randhava, it deals with the 18th century school of Rajasthani miniature painting that arose in the princely state of Kishangad. Founded by the Jodhpur prince Kishan Singh in 1609. The paintings of this school are clearly distinguished by their individualistic facial types, the sensitive, refined features of the men and women are drawn with pointed no noses and chins, deeply curved eyes, and, and circuitous locks of hair. Often, panoramic landscapes provide the background for the action. The second book was Paintings oh. of the Babar Nama, which oh, analyzed okay. 20 paintings of the illustrated manuscript of the Babar Nama in the collection of the National Museum, Delhi. As Dr. Ndhava had also seen two other <coughs> illustrated manuscripts of the book in the State Museum of Oriental Art at Moscow in 1970, oh, and the next okay. year still okay. another okay. illustrated edition of in the okay. British okay. Museum, he felt confident that he could write a book on the paintings of the National Museum manuscript. Was, uh, At the end of this book, he repro are reproduced all the illustrations <coughs> of the manuscript in black and white. Uh -huh, uh -huh, Dr. Ndhava's third it book, is, yeah, third general book, right? Indian Sculpture, The Scene, yeah, Themes yeah, and Legends, right? is a pictorial survey uh -huh. of the masterpieces of Indian, Indian Sculpture. Uh -huh. The last book in the series, named Indian Painting, Paintings, Exploration, oh, Research, uh -huh. and Publications, published posthumously in 1986 by the uh -huh. Government Museum and Art Gallery, Chandigarh. Oh, 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 it comprises oh, 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 mostly oh, correspondence oh, with oh, art oh, historians oh, and book reviews. Dr. Ndhava breathed his last on March 3rd, 1986, in his oh, farmhouse oh, oh, oh. in Karad. Just oh, oh. a week later, I got the just a, uh, just a week before, I got the honor of, after the, sorry, a guy got honor of Dr. W.G. Archer Award for the best book on art by his hands. 
I am fortunate to have met Dr. Dhawa a number of times. The first time it was in 1979 when I went to his residence at Kharad to request the inauguration of my one man show of colleges and uh, paintings in Government Museum and Art Gallery Chandigarh, to which he gracefully, graciously agreed. He arrived at the gallery in his car bearing the number plate inscribed with CX01. One hour before the opening and conveyed to me that he was sitting in the adjoining museum and to call him when the author, uh, when the other guests gather. When many years later, I met him at Punjabi Bhavan at Ludhiana, he still remembered my collage works. The last time I met him was at the prize distribution ceremony of the Punjab Classical Academy Chandigarh in February 1986 when my book Mughal Monuments of the Punjab and Haryana was honored with Dr. W.G. Archer Award. After the function was over, I tried to find out Dr. Sir to express my gratitude for the award, but someone told me that Dr. Sir had uh, some health problems and so returned home. Just after a week, I got the sad news of his demise. I bow my head before that greatest son <clears> and well wisher <throat> of Punjab, who, despite his innumerable accomplishments, remained a modest, grounded, and self disciplined person. He was an exemplar of a dedicated civil officer, capable of doing great good for the community if only his motives were honest. Punjab. Alas, didn't produce a second MS Randhava. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Parihar. You have given such a comprehensive account of Dr. MS Randhava. I wonder how could he do so many books as a civil servant, and that too, not an ordinary civil servant, with so many responsibilities. Uh, Professor Pritam said out that I went to Chandigarh to attend a meeting at 10. I said, meeting, he says, which meeting? There are three meetings that are going on. Which one do you want to attend? How could he manage three meetings? He'll go in one room, start. Go to the other room, start, and then return. What are your findings? Precise. So he was really God-gifted. You have given us a very yeah. comprehensive picture for which we are thankful. You also paid tribute to Professor B. N. Goswami. And you have covered his literary aspect. He was a great civil servant. I'm glad we have a great civil servant, very respected Ramesh Indir Singh, who is also known for his literary activities, every reader. I think he'll be able to throw some light on the administrative genius of Dr. M. Sandava in his presidential remarks, Professor Ramesh Indir Singh. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Mahendra Singh Ji. I must compliment Professor Parihar for giving us an account of the books written by Dr. Randhava. Thank you, sir. And his interest in uh, art, particularly the miniatures of the mountains of uh, Himalayas. Professor Saab has covered broadly um, all aspects of uh, late Dr. Randhava's personality. He certainly was a man heads and shoulders apart from others. He was a man of vision. He was a man of action. And when you combine vision with action, mm -hmm. if we can visualize what kind of outcomes would there be. And as very rightly and appropriately raised by Professor Mahinder Singh, uh, I mean, look at his role and contribution and how many of his uh, colleagues then or now, you know, uh, in the next generation or generations uh, have, uh, where do they stand as compared to his uh, contributions? He not only contributed uh, to art uh, and li literature, the one very important aspect of his, which uh, Professor Saab has mentioned in passing, as a role as an administrator, was during the days of partition of India. 
He was moved to Delhi in uh, November 96, 46, my, my apologies. In, uh, uh, yes, in November uh, 90, 1946 as DC of uh, uh, capital uh, city of Delhi. Delhi. And that time a British by the name of uh, La Pelle was the deputy commissioner. Uh, because his name was a bit of a tongue twister for the for the local uh, Indians, he was called as Allah Bailey in popular <laughs> language. And as his name, um, this or distortion of his name suggested, he was viewed as little uh, partial in his dealings with uh, the violence which had broken uh, out in uh, the capital region. So Mr. Randhawa was summoned and uh, appointed the deputy commissioner. Initial years, he dealt with, uh, uh, with, the, with the inter community violence in this area. And it is important to mention here that though Delhi had a cantonment even then, but there were only two companies of army stationed in Delhi. Now, uh, uh, knowledgeable people know that an infantry battalion you know, has four uh, companies, actionable companies, and of course, one. Sport and Adam Company. So you can you can see from this that there was not even half a battalion located in Delhi to deal with the violence which had broken out. He was very successful in controlling or at least curbing the the, the, the killings which went on uh, in the capital region. And then his fo focus was to rehabilitate people which were coming to Delhi from. Uh, the other side of uh, partitioned India. Uh, I happened to read after Professor Mendes Singh invited me his uh, book, which is a kind of a autobiography. Mm -hmm. uh, he calls it uh, Aap Bhiti. It is written in Punjabi, but translated uh, uh, in English. It's available. It's on the net. You Google it. It's available for free. How he, along with his uh, two uh, PSOs, personal security officers, went around the city of Delhi controlling violence and even had to shoot himself from his own weapon, you know, to control uh, mm. then violence. He was also um, uh, in Delhi at the time of assassination of late uh, father of the nation, Mahatma Gandhi, and uh, reached Birla Manda. Uh, I will refer to two uh, stories, if I may say so, or the two instances which he uh, gives in his book of his effort to rehabilitate the refugees who came uh, from Pakistan to Delhi. We have heard the name of Scots. It's a, it's one of the leading yeah. industrial yeah. houses yeah. of uh, India. They were pioneers in uh, manufacturing in indigenous uh, practice and also motorcycle. Uh, I mean, my generation would recognize it. Rajdut, it was called before Java swept it away. Uh, of course, today's generation may not have heard the names of these uh, <laughs> mobikes. So he says he was he was told to rehabilitate the ref refugees and one way was to give permits for taxis and buses. And so an announcement was made and people came and one of the persons who approached him uh, in, in the queue was Mr. Lake Mr. Nanda, the founder of Scots. Mm -hmm. And he gave him two uh, permits for taxis. And then we know what, what, what uh, was left to the entrepreneurship and enterprise of Mr. Nanda. And from that humble beginning, you know, he created an empire. Similarly, he also mentions that uh, he allowed the people who came from Pakistan to set up small shops and eateries in uh, um, in, 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 uh, near the Lal Kila and Chandni Chowk. Mm -hmm. So a complaint went to the then Home Secretary, Mr. Banerjee, who was a Bengali, obviously, as his name says, that he is helping the Punjabis because the <laughs> local uh, traders, you know, faced great competition from these uh, people, they were, their enterprise, their uh, hardworking nature. So he was called by, by Mr. Uh, by Mr. Banerjee to explain give an explanation, he told him very bluntly that, look, these people need more help. It's not that I'm being uh, in any way partial to, to them. 
Okay. But uh, that's how he helped. And from there, he moved on to Punjab, was director uh, rehabilitation, uh, director of uh, vacuum property for re redistribution of the uh, properties left by the Muslim migrating people. Uh, but I would say, and, and uh, I would say that uh, his greater contribution, uh, which has not been mentioned so far, was in the area of agriculture. He was associated as Secretary of the Indian Council of Agricultural Sciences and later on as its Vice President. And he has also written a number of books on agriculture, you know, uh, history of uh, agriculture in India, history of uh, ICR, Green Revolution, uh, and so on and so forth. He was Vice Chancellor, the second Mr. Thapar, uh, also an ICS officer, established the Punjab Agricultural University. And he was VC thereafter for almost eight years. This was the, the time when Green Revolution, uh, you know, uh, the, the state made an effort to usher in the Green Revolution. And his contribution is enormous in this area. Uh, he also established a number of art galleries, museums, um, uh, to name a few. Uh, he... Uh, was uh, the founder of uh, the Chandigarh Museum, Punjab Arts Council, Museum of Cultural Heritage at Ludhiana, uh, then anglo sikh War Memorial uh, at, at mm. Rosebud. So, I mean, look at the man. I mean, uh, and and, uh, and he in 1972 he was conferred Padam Bhushan, and one would expect, you know, there is a category of these uh, Padma Awards. Uh, like civil servants and uh, and so on and so forth, that he would have got this honor, you know, as a civil servant. But this award was in the category of science and engineering, oh. which, which, which speaks volumes about the man's contribution to uh, to to agriculture, uh, hybrid uh, bringing in hybrid seeds, uh, bringing in high yielding varieties popularizing those because extension work was uh, a great challenge and it did. And considering, uh, mind you, uh, Professor Parihar has mentioned about his origin, but you will be surprised to hear that he did his matriculation from Muksa, Khalsa College Muksa, where his father was posted as a uh, revenue official, the Sildar. Muksa in those days was back of beyond. <laughs> You know what you call Timbuktu. <laughs> today, of course, it's a, uh, today it's a district headquarter, uh, but even today it remains the backwaters of the of, of, of Punjab as compared to let's say Dwapar region or Amritsar, Maja, and even dwell parts of Malwa. So considering that he did his schooling in this remote village and then went on to Lahore to do his MSc in agriculture competed in the Indian civil service and made it to it in the first attempt. So the man was extremely <laughs> bright uh, and uh, he helped uh, later on Punjab in an enormous way. Chandigarh has already been mentioned. He was uh, say, he was member of the committee for the capital city uh, before uh, the, the city was uh, 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 built. And they say that whereas La Carbusier uh, gave the city its body, it is Mr. Randhava who gave it its life. And this life came in the form of the gardens, the, uh, the flowery trees he planted, the museums he created, the art council, and other various uh, cultural activities which he uh, gave to the city. And the town has ever since flourished. One question uh, I would like to answer with Professor uh, Mahinder Singh Day is that how could he do all this? Uh, how much time did he have? Obviously, it is it is it, it, it is great. What distinct? <laughs> Uh, from the civil servants, maybe more even, I might have missed one or two, is that uh, whereas most of us today write about ourselves, you see, I did this, I did that, you know, and I um, uh, so-and-so did this, so-and-so did that. 
But Mr. Dhawa's doctor, Dhawa's contribution is that he, he contributed literature, he contributed art, he contributed science in the form of agri uh, books on agriculture. <clears throat> a great man, uh, I would say he was the founder of uh, modern uh, uh, <coughs> In civil service initiative in India, uh, because after the British left, there are very few names, uh, you know, who uh, who can equal to Dr. Randhawa. Uh, at the national level, maybe he has not received the kind of recognition some others have received, but that is because the others have uh, distinguished themselves in the areas of politics, law and order, you know, those areas. So therefore, they got the, 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 the projection, the eminence, uh, and, and, and the stage. Randhawa's contribution is more, uh, I would say, fundamental. He worked with Mr. Nehru, he worked with Mr. Patel, and there are references to both the leaders in his uh, autobiography. A great son of Punjab, a great son of India, his contributions will be remembered for all times to come. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Sir Ramesh Indra Singh Ji. Uh, before we propose a vote of thanks, i like to, with your permission, make a small mention Please. how he patronized men and women of letters. In Delhi, there's a horse cast in and Dava made it for seven writers. The Amrita Pritam, Kartas, and Dugan are this. They were staying in Barsatis, you understand Barsatis, in Devnagar. He asked the contractor that I've never taken any consideration from you. But today you have to deposit draft on their behalf. Ask them to, without reading, sign the papers. They signed the... And then, after three years, he asked someone to make a garage in the toilet and boundary wall and force them to shift. At that time, they were abusing the Nava from Devnagar, where they could eat <clears throat> property chart and others, to remote Oscars. Now you imagine the value of those 500-yard plots to all those people, and he, to Papa Pritam Singh, who is a known, was known a good publisher, he gave him two things, a press in Chandni Chok, farmhouse in Maroli, and 500-yard plot in Hoskas in Glaive. This is how he patronized men of letters, and I believe he didn't make anything for his own. That was the greatness of Amazon That's Dava. True. That's, true. Uh, That's true. So I'm grateful to both of you. I request my colleague, Professor Manjit Kaur, to propose a vote of thanks. Over to her. Thank you, sir. It's yeah. a privilege to uh, give the vote of thanks. And uh, today is, now I know why uh, Dr. Mahindra Singh Ji was actually saying that we must hold this lecture. Because, ask, I mean, after listening to you, this illuminary, I understand that what a great man he was, and he should be celebrated. So um, I, I'm really grateful to Professor Parihar on the behalf of Southern that he has presented such a res well research paper and the kind of books he, he made and the kind of uh, contribution he made to the art. And uh, definitely when I was thinking when he was referring to the B.N. Goswami's uh, interpretation on his book that uh, uh, how could one, what kind of interpretation one could write on those plates again in in the in be below the below the uh, pictures, <clears throat> and that really requires a lot of sensitivity and also a joy and love, and that is for the art that one could write such a sensitive kind of captions. So I mean, I was trying to understand as to what kind of person that would be, that who is actually a maybe a scientist, maybe an administrator, and also maybe doing something such a sensitive kind of uh, approach to art. So that was really unique. And I'm really grateful that we, uh, Dr. Mahindra proposed that we should actually, actually, uh, uh, we should actually uh, hold this lecture. And I'm, uh, I really feel that people who have not attended this lecture have missed something very great. And uh, the kind of uh, administrative kind of roles he has played. And I'm surprised to know that uh, today that he, he had to also hit himself with his bullet to really undertake the kind of responsibility he was given to. And those responsibilities he's made is such a sincere effort that one could really hit oneself to really to undertake such responsibilities. I'm really grateful for this panel. It was a really unique panel which we, we could put together. I'm grateful to Professor Parihar and to uh, Sadar Indrajit uh, 
and um, Ramesh Nadji. And I'm also glad that uh, Dr. Manmohan Singh Ji and uh, uh, Gusharan Kauji also could attend this lecture. And uh, they are listening to us and their presence is very, very encouraging. Thank you so much for this today's lecture. It was very interesting. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Prasparyar, great lecture.